All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going, team? Here, and this is BX Just Weekly, episode fifty-five, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And uh, yeah, we got a pretty relaxed week this time around. Actually, not that many news, not that many releases, but there are some major things uh, coming up quite soon. So let's get started and let's get go through um, just whatever we have. Hey, Manda Putra, welcome to the stream. All right, so the first article we got here today is called Using Google Closure Compiler to Deliver Better JavaScript. And it's essentially a tutorial slash explanation of what the Google Closure Compiler is and how do you actually use it to make your code better or I guess to ship your code in a better form, uh, to rephrase it in a slightly better way. If you never heard about Google Closure Compiler, I think it was one of the first actually tools for JavaScript that optimized the builds for production. It does things like dead code elimination, pre-evaluation and stuff like this. Um, I would call it grandfather of all the JavaScript tooling, I guess. So if you never heard of it, uh, just have a look at it. And uh, there's some interesting ideas here, like, you know, the things that it does have transitioned to the more modern tools and uh, things like pre-evaluation, dead code elimination, removal of uh, unused variables and stuff like this is, is exactly how it basically started. So if you never used it, never heard about it, make sure to check out the article. It does give you a pretty good overview. If you already know what the Google Closure Compiler is, you won't really find anything new in here. Next article we got here is, <clears throat> God damn it, apologies. Um, next article we got here is using React's use callback hook to preserve identity of partially applied callbacks in collections. So this looks at a very specific problem of when you iterate over a collection of things and then render the same bit of code with different callbacks, right? On a very naive way, you would just use the fact that creates a handler and then assigns it to a specific reference, which is the current reference. But that doesn't really work because every time something will happen, this effect will be called, right? So this will be actually called more times than you want it to do. Uh, and the author exactly talks about this, about handling these callbacks and making them nicer and making them only change whenever the actual code changes. And the ways to do that, starting from the very simple sort of Let's start by using the callback and passing the on change function to it so that it only changes when our handler function changes. And then go into memoization with uh, Lawdash and going further to the, um, I think React memo as well, if I remember correctly. But yeah, if, if that's a problem that you've encountered, do make sure to check out this article. It gives you a pretty good overview of how you can mitigate that, especially with um, specifically using the code editors that are sort of third party and re do not rely on React code, uh, which actually hooks make it a lot easier to uh, work with. So if you, you know, if you're looking at doing something like this, do check it out as well, because it gives you a pretty nice overview of that topic too. All right, next article we got here is writing resilient components by Dan Abramov and uh, his overreacted blog. So this talks about, uh, well, first of all, it actually, um, the introduction is a bit, uh, how do you put it? So we had a tweet from Dan quite some time ago where he said that, you know, linters can get annoying and you shouldn't dwell too much on what the linter tells you. And if it doesn't make you more productive, you should remove those rules. And this is essentially sort of more expanded version of that tweet that says, hey, the linter should actually help you not just say arbitrary things like, for example, set state in component demand is forbidden. Why is it forbidden? Is it bad? No, it's not bad. There are legitimate use cases. If it would be bad, React simply wouldn't allow it. So uh, you shouldn't like, you know, there he says like the use Mary Kondo for your linting config and so on and so forth. And then he goes to outline the sort of best practices uh, for when, uh, for the moments when you write the components, right? So how do you write the best components? What, what kind of rules do you have to follow to make your components resilient and to make them better? Uh, the outline is quite straightforward. Don't stop the data flow. Always be ready to render. No component is a singleton and keep the local state isolated. If none of this makes sense to you when you hear about them and you think about the React components, because not all of them made sense to me when I first read the head headlines, then definitely make sure to read through the article. It does goes quite in depth as it usually happens with Dan 
uh, into how the you know how you should structure components, how you should look at the data rendering, how you should look at the local state, how you should look at the other things mentioned here. Basically, it's really good. So if you're writing React components, I would definitely say go ahead, look at it, read through it, and look at all the examples that Dan get, um, outlined here because all of them are very useful. Even if you think that you already know how to write React components and how to improve them with hooks, there's actually quite significant amount of examples using hooks here. All right. Next thing we got here is roll your own analytics, how to build a free privacy focused alternative to Google Analytics. And I absolutely like, um, like love this <laughs> animation that the author has here. So the idea is very simple. Um, Google Analytics run on a lot of websites. And I mean, let's be honest, Google Analytics are amazing, right? So they provide you some insane features that you would probably would take years for your own, like to implement on your own, right? But the thing is that majority of time you don't really care about those features. And when using the Google Analytics, you actually have to get the consent from the user, uh, at least for the European Union and the GDPR, uh, for the GDPR compliance, right? So it might be a bit annoying and you might not need that. You might just want a very basic stuff. You don't want to mess with the GDPR compliance and dynamic loading of uh, analytics and stuff like this. So this article exactly talks about this. How do we roll your own analytics that are not ad blocked, that are anonymous, so you don't care about GDPR compliance, there is no bloat, it is fast, it is free, and it is easily replicable and requires no server from your site. So in this case, the author does a very, very simple thing. He uses the uh, logging session on the clients, then just throwing that session into the Lambda function on uh, Netlify and then just storing the data on Google Sheets. Now here's the interesting thing, I still don't understand completely why you would need additional Lambda function because now that Google uh, Spreadsheets and Google Docs actually have API, I think you should be able to just call it remotely without even having to do that. Maybe I am wrong here, maybe you just, maybe I guess you have to hide the API key somehow, right? But anyway, so the general idea is super simple. You just, yeah, throw it into the Google spreadsheet and then you can analyze it in any way you want. If that sounds interesting, if you want to roll your own analytics, make sure to check it out. Uh, if not, then well, that's, you know, it's, it's not extremely complicated topic. There's nothing really super fancy here. Maybe if you were interested in how to do the serverless and Netlify functions, then check it out as well. All right. Next thing we got here is why transducers are cool. Um, an article talking about transducers and uh, functional light JavaScript, so to say, the uh, sort of it, it expands on the uh, one of the appendixes to the functional light JavaScript book by Kyle Simpson, which is by the way, a really great book. And if you haven't heard about it or haven't read it, I would recommend picking it up and at least having a browse through it because there are some really good things inside. But yes, the article talks about transducers, functional composition, and how they can help you write cleaner code and compose functions in a better way when you map and filter over things. Uh, if you're already familiar with the transducers concept, you won't really find anything new here. If you are, if you never heard that word or still confused about it or just getting into functional programming, then I do recommend looking through that because uh, Chris does a very good job of explaining what transducers are, how do you write your own, and how do they help you in writing better code, essentially. It also references to some existing libraries uh, like transducers.js, uh, so make sure to look at that too. All right. Next thing we got here is an annoying install app pop-up. I hope they will do that. Um, so the, there's the, um, the web starting to become like we, we had pop-up blockers and everything before, right? And now we have this um, notifications thing which you have to block every time. And now we also have the install app for progressive app apps that pops up every time I don't wanna install it. So there is at least a proposal now to change the notifications bubble to be, um, so to only allow it to be uh, appear, God damn it, I'm terrible today. So there's a proposal to, for the notifications bubble to only allow it to pop up when the user does something on the page, right? So it's only, it requires an interaction. I want something as well for the um, uh, app install because every website that is a progressive web app now causes this bloody pop up and I have to press cancel every time I go there, which is a bit annoying, but there we go. All right, so the next article we got here is 
React State, choose wisely. It's a pretty comprehensive guide on how you can handle state in React without uh, relying on any third party libraries. In three specific cases, local state, global state, and context for shared state, essentially. If all of that uh, sounds familiar, if you already know how all of that works, then well, you won't really find anything new here. It's a pretty basic overview of everything. Um, if you are still struggling with understanding some of the parts of the state in React, then this is essentially a very comprehensive guide to, well, doing states in roll your own way, basically in React. Um, yeah, basically overviewing everything you have to know and even has a handy matrix here that um, compares the ease of use encapsulation and availability uh, through all the approaches. So yeah, there's, I mean, I don't really have much more to say. It's, it's very straightforward. All right. Next thing we got here is painless React animations via CSS transitions. A pretty basic article that outlines usage of, let me zoom in a bit, usage of CSS transitions in React components to make them uh, nicely animated, essentially. The example here is this expandable uh, input field, I believe, um, that basically, you know, at the very beginning just appears and then the author proceeds to animate it to have a very fancy, nice slide out animation with CSS transitions, which are, if you never use them, they are very easy to use and allow you to do some pretty fancy stuff. So, yeah, this is basically a quite basic tutorial uh, showing you how to do that, showing you how you can inspect all that, tweak it, different timing functions, and what do you have to keep in mind when working with CSS transitions in React? Like, for example, they won't work if you unmount the whole component and re-render it again, so you only have to change that style property, right? There's also some additional tooling exists for React that would make those animations slightly easier to do. So, yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is another guide to use state in React. And this one specifically talks about use state hook and uh, migration from the old ES6 components to the use state hook, right? So basically all that you wanted to know, all that you ever needed to know, I guess, and maybe couldn't find in the docs. Although I don't think there's that much additional things here that rather than in the docs themselves, because I mean, it, you know, I said it multiple times, but I think official docs for React are really great. And unless you just wanted a nice walkthrough, you will find everything there. But if you, yeah, I guess if you want to walk through that just guides you through the process of migrating the old ES6 component to use state hook, then there you go, here it is. Nothing beyond that is years, not really advanced. All right, next thing we got here is a complete guide to threads in Node.js. And just as the title says, it is I wouldn't call it a complete guide to threads in Node.js, but rather a complete guide to worker threads in Node.js because it really talks about the um, worker threads module, right? The one that we talked about already multiple times and how to use it, how to get started with it, how to pass the data around and so on and so forth. So basically everything you ever wanted to know about it is here. But so why am I saying that it's not just guide the threads because there's way more ways to work in threads in Node.js, right? So the worker is not the only thing, even though it's baked in and core, you still has, have other things like, for example, accessing the, and I completely forgot the name of it, God damn it, uh, the primitive that V8 actually uses for uh, worker threads, um, isolates, right? This is, this is the word that I'm looking for. So for example, you can get direct access to V8 isolates and roll your own isolates, which is essentially a different threads, right? So, but anyway, so if you're interested in worker threads and you still don't understand how they work, this is a very good guide that will explain everything you have to know about. Right, next thing we got here is the definitive guide to web scraping with Node.js and Puppeteer. Um, again, as Dial says, pretty detailed guide on how to scrape stuff with Puppeteer. There are some interesting things here. So even if you used Puppeteer before and you think you know all of it or maybe majority of it, how to scrape with it and stuff because you know it's not exactly rocket science. Um, there are some interesting points here and there. Like for example, I didn't know Puppeteer has a specific option for uh, slowing everything down. So you can literally just say uh, slow motion 250 milliseconds and it will simulate the slowdown of a user for every interaction to 250 milliseconds, which can be extremely useful when fighting the 
you know, anti-bot systems. So um, if you are into scraping, if you are using Puppeteer or maybe you were looking at it to do some screenshots or testing or whatever, then do check it out. This is a pretty good guy. All right. Next thing we got here is Redux in 27 lines of code. It is an article essentially guiding you through re-implementing your own Redux. Like if you already know how Redux works, you won't really find anything new here. If you are still confused as to how it works, why does it need all that get state reducers, dispatch and whatever, then look through this. It is very straightforward. I mean, the Redux itself is a very straightforward concept. And this article does a very good job of explaining how exactly it works code wise and how you can implement your own. Obviously, you won't, ha you won't have all the Redux features and, um, you know, fancy things that you have in the modern version. But the very basic version is right here. Um, 27 lines of code. It is kind of great. So yeah, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is how to think and type in TypeScript. This is a tutorial on yes, exactly thinking and typing in TypeScript it essentially walks you through the syntax combination, different types that TypeScript has and the specific use cases and how to use those types in those specific use cases. I am not a TypeScript person, so can't really commend much on that. Uh, so if you're just getting started with TypeScript, I think this would be a good starting point. All right, next thing we got here is how to build a command line interface with Node.js. This is a pretty basic tutorial on building a CLI app using Inquirer, uh, Chalk, Aura, and a bunch of other libs that allow you to do a relatively fancy command line interfaces with, uh, you know, relatively easily. Like, um, yeah, in this case, they just build a simple app that asks you a few questions and then does some things. Um, it's, it's straightforward, you know, if you ever build command line apps, you won't really find anything amazingly new here. If you were thinking, about building one and you didn't know where to start, then do check this out. It is actually quite good. All right, next thing we got here, modern and clean routing with hooks. Uh, talking about React specifically here. So this is, um, I guess, introduction of a library slash tutorial on how you can roll your own routing using just React hooks without any external router. And author here build a hook router library that is just 1.8 kilobytes. Um, I guess that is gzipped or probably, let's see, yes, minified and gzipped. And basically allows you to navigate to add routing uh, using hooks. The syntax is very straightforward. You define your routes as object with route as property and function that returns a page as a value for that property. And then you just use routes hook and that's basically it. So it, it seems quite nice. I don't know how it will scale to a bigger apps or how it will work with a more complex use cases, but it seems to be quite nice for at least the very basic apps. I mean, again, you know, 1.8 kilobyte of um, min zip size is very impressive. And the article itself also talks about how you can actually implement that, some advanced usage cases and how exactly it works. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Seems to be pretty nice. All right. Next thing we got here is I don't hate arrow functions uh, article by Kyle Simpson, the author of the you don't know JS uh, and a bunch of other really good books uh, where he talks about um, arrow functions and how he doesn't like when they are used in some specific cases. And it seems like he's not the only one who uh, supports this sort of uh, viewpoint. Uh, and he built the proper arrow ESLint plugin that allows you to enforce some of those things. So if you don't like how some people use arrow functions in some cases, or maybe you yourself don't like to use them in some cases and want to enforce it using ESLint, have a look through this article. There is some um, arguments here. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting to read. He's always very thorough in his research and his arguments. So make sure to have a look at it. It is always fascinating. All right, next thing we got here is how to manipulate CSS colors with JavaScript. Now you think, you know, what's hard about that? Well, this guide goes very in depth on that as in, uh, you know, mathematical formulas in depth on uh, lightning uh, saturation and all that kind of stuff. So if you are heavily involved in working with colors, then this might be very interesting to you or if you wanted to, because yeah, that's like basically half of the article is mathematics related to colors, which is <laughs> kind of crazy, but it's, it's actually kind of good. So yeah, if you ever wanted to work with colors from JavaScript, do check this out. It gives you a pretty good um, and pretty hardcore mathematical foundations for that. 
All right, uh, next thing we got here, and I think that is actually we're done with the article. So now it's just a bunch of uh, smaller announcements and awesome bits left. The first one we got here is an article from Pika web team called the future without Webpack, and where they explain essentially why they made Pika web and how is it different from Webpack and how why you should use it essentially, right? So the idea is that it's a configuration less bundler that is super easy to use, super easy to set up and essentially just hides, hides bundling a different place, which actually sounds very similar to a uh, parcel. And I'm still not completely sure how is it different from parcel. One of the cool points about the Pika web that I like is that um, they sort of say that view source is back and they actually show you the source of a specific file. So when you do view source, you can see the original code, which is kind of awesome. So definitely like that. So if you were interested in Pika web, but uh, wanted to know more details, do check this out. Next thing we got here is very awesome project uh, from a uh, username uh, Vasiop. I'm not sure exactly how to read that. Vasiop, um, whatever, you know what? <laughs> I'm gonna break it anyway. So he built a um, C tutorial that runs in a browser, uh, I guess C virtual machine slash tutorial that builds in a browser and guides you through writing things in C. Now, here's the here's how it looks. So you got this uh, assistant that basically teaches you C, right? So you got these tutorials, you can put the cursor there and you can compile it. Now, the neat thing is that this is a full on virtual machine that shows you the compiled code, the stacks, the memory, everything and you can you know, go step by step through that and see how exactly the C execution works. It is awesome. All of that is open source and available in GitHub. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. It looks absolutely amazing. Or if you want to learn C as well, I mean, there's, uh, there's a bunch of lessons. So do make sure to check it out. All right, next thing we got here is a tweet from Miles Borins, who is uh, working on Node.js. Uh, after over a year of work, uh, Paul, <laughs> I'll request pull request to update the ESM implementation in Node.js has been opened. You can now use .js for ES modules by setting type module in package JSON. Node.js specifier resolution is not on by default and there is now .cjs file support. So we got another change in ES modules implementation Node.js and yes, you can now use them without using MJS by just using .js, but for that you will have to specify a type module in package JSON. It is really, really cool. And I cannot wait for this to be shipped in production. I think this would be my preferred way of using it, essentially. Uh, it, you, you also, there's like a bunch of different ways to enable the module resolution modes uh, and other stuff. So if you're curious to check out the PR itself, as well as the discussion, and there is a lot of reactions over here, it is kind of, kind of awesome, to be honest. So there you go. Right, next thing we got here is a tweet from uh, Yang Guo, who is working for Google on a uh, Fuxia operating system. If you probably heard about it, it's an US um, that is supposed to replace Android, I think, but we don't really have that many details about it right now. But here's the cool thing. So they are looking for a person who, uh, who would port the Node.js to Fuxia because they are interested in bringing JavaScript as a programming language, like first party programming language to that platform, which is absolutely awesome. If Fuxia is going to be next Android, we're going to have JavaScript as the core language for it uh, right from the day one. And this is just amazing, if you ask me. So um, yeah, again, you know, they're hiring. So if you're interested, if you are C++, Node.js engineer, or if you want to be one, just go ahead and apply. Why not? That sounds like a pretty exciting opportunity, to be honest. All right. Next thing we got here is experimenting with the Streams API uh, and the specifically Streams API in Fetch. Uh, this is a thing I didn't know existed, but apparently there is a new experimental API that allows you to uh, work with the Fetch response as a stream. You can pipe it through different things like text decoder, you know, splitting, parsing, JSON or whatever, and then write it, get a reader and use the stream to write it to, for example, DOM in this case, which is pretty cool. I mean, the article itself is not exactly super large, but it is kind of awesome. I didn't know that existed. Like I didn't even know it was a spec. I did I, for some reason I missed it completely, but yes, this is a thing that exists. Unfortunately for now is pretty poorly supported. Majority of times it's still behind the flags almost everywhere, 
But the fact that it is there is kind of damn awesome. So there you go. If that sounds interesting, do check out the article. All right, next thing we got here is intro to RxJS concepts with vanilla JavaScript. This is a basic tutorial that uh, essentially guides you through implementing your own version of observables and observers. Um, if you are using RxJS and still don't understand how exactly they work, this will teach you everything you need to know, basically. It is actually quite good. Um, I think, I don't remember whose video, I think it was Ben Lesh, uh, video from ben, like the talk from Ben Lesh on one of the conferences where he guided you through implementing your own observable. And this is exactly when RxJS clicked for me. So if you're still struggling, make sure to read through this because this is pretty close. And uh, this might just clear up all the things about Next.js, oh, sorry, RxJS for you. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is JavaScript's new hash private class fields. Um, I shouldn't say hash private, it's just private class fields, right? So if you didn't know, the private class fields in um, JavaScript are now a thing, and they are now shipped in uh, V8, which was released, I think, just this week. They are now behind, like working without any experimental flags or anything. So you can actually, you, sh you should be able to use them in the next, I think, no, in two stable releases of Chrome, because the V8 is lagging, like, I think, by two releases or something, right? And uh, this article guides you through the syntax. How do you actually define them? How do you use them? How do you access them? How do you set them? And what do you actually can do with them? It's quite straightforward. So if you are interested, make sure to check it out. If you already know how they work, then, well, there's not, not really much new here. All right, next thing we got here is a collection of tweets from Sebastian McKenzie. Uh, you might know him as the original author of the very first version of the Babel. Um, he is now working on a tool that is that was called Sonic, then Hydra, now it's called Rome, and it's a JavaScript toolchain. It has zero dependencies, everything is custom. It has a linter, bundler, compiler, formatter, testing framework, dependency manager, and more and all of this as a single system. Honestly, that sounds pretty damn awesome. So the, the whole um, thread here is, is like, all of that is collected from Twitter. It's a Twitter thread that um, shows his work over the last couple of years, I guess. And there is some really cool things in here. Like one of the most impressive demos he has is closer to the end, um, where, where is it? I don't remember. Um, I think it maybe it didn't render for some reason, but there we go. So there's the there was a demo somewhere. Ah, there we go. There it is. For some reason, the image is not rendered. So there's a project that contains uh, 524 files and 40k lines of code linted in three seconds, which is mind blowing if you ask me. So I'm quite excited to see when he releases that and how it's going to look. And if it's once again going to change the way we write JavaScript because Babel very much did that. And, you know, it's kind of amazing to see his work. So there you go. If you're interested, make sure to read through the whole thing. There is a lot of pretty cool details here. Okay. Next thing we got here is the uh, release of LLVM version 8 uh, makes the WebAssembly target stable. So it's no longer experimental and you can now compile LLVM stuff to WebAssembly without uh, being afraid that something is going to break essentially, which is kind of awesome. Right. Next thing we got here is an uh, interview with Henry Zhu, who is a um, maintainer, the core maintainer of the Babel right now, about his work as an open source maintainer, the open source in general and stuff like this. So if you're curious, make sure to check it out. There is some pretty cool thoughts and pretty cool... Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, interview is really great. So just have a look at it. All right. And the last thing I want to highlight for the uh, tiny bits and things section is the humble book bundle web programming by O'Reilly. This is it is going to be up for nine more days and you can pick up quite a lot of really good books for just 15 bucks. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of really, really good books in here. So if you haven't read some of them, if you are reading a lot of books uh, or maybe were considering to pick up some JavaScript and CSS books and React books, then, well, there you go. You can, at the very basic level, you can pick up five books for $1, which is, yeah, just nothing. <laughs> so there you go. All right, now we're coming to the release. No, wait, that's not, yes, releases section right now. That's correct. I am got confused by the Twitter here. 
So the first release of the week we got here is Code Sandbox version three that is coming with VS Code extensions. You can now install VS Code extensions for your Code Sandbox, which is insane. You There is an editor redesign, um, added DevTools functionality and Vitor and TypeScript refactoring support. It looks bonkers. I like Code Sandbox is my go-to thing for quite some time when I want to experiment with code and they just made it like 10 times better. So there you go. Next release we got here is Nest.js 6. I honestly never used it, so cannot really commit much of it. If you use it, make sure to check out the release notes and maybe migrate. Um, I, I, I don't even know what the framework is, so <laughs> that's basically all you're gonna hear from me. Next thing we got here is React Router version five, uh, which is actually backwards compatible to React Router version four. The reason it was bumped to version five is because of the peer dependencies that required to be bumped and might break things. But theoretically, you should be able to just upgrade and use it as is. It just improves the compatibility with React 16, uh, no more update blocking and a bunch of housekeeping fixes, bugs, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Right, and next release we got here is V8 version 7.4, which we already talked briefly about some of the features like JITLIS V8, for example, and the most exciting for me, at least thing here is WebAssembly threads and atomics are now shipped and enabled on all non Android operating system without any flags or anything like that. So we finally got threads in WebAssembly. I am quite curious to see how that will change the landscape of libraries we can get there and to see uh, because you know, the threads and atomics was probably one of the most uh, one of the things that most people complained about. Uh, in the native land when they was like targeting WebAssembly. Spe specifically, there was a lot of talks about that in Golang uh, community. That and uh, garbage collection. So we'll be quite curious to see how exactly that changes things. There's also as usual significant performance improvements and memory improvements and private class fields are also shipped in this without any flags, which is kind of awesome. Right, and I think the last, no, not the last release, the um, another release we got here, TypeScript 3.4 release candidate. The most important thing here is faster subsequent builds with incremental flag that essentially allows you to rebuild just to change things, which makes it super fast. So if you are using TypeScript, exciting news for you. And the last release we got here is React Redux version 7 beta, which adds support for React hooks. And yes, yeah, so you know if you're using it, make sure to check it out, try it out, and maybe migrate to hooks. Seems like basically as long as there is no additional bugs introduced, it's gonna be released next week. Maybe in two weeks, the worst case if there's something breaks. So yes, you can now finally use React Redux official one with hooks, there you go. All right, that is it for releases and uh, new versions. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos. And the first thing I wanna to highlight today is this thing called Buster, Capture Solver Extension for Humans. It's, um, really neat extension that solves capture for you in a very silly way. So <laughs> the, uh, the way it does it, it basically uses the accessibility option that um, pronounces the phrase that you have to retype there. And then just uses the voice recognition API to send that phrase to the voice recognition API and then just enter whatever the voice recognition API recognizes, which seems to work like 99% of time. <laughs> it's very, very good actually. So if you got annoyed by captures, make sure to have a look at that. Or if you're curious how exactly it was made, it's not extremely complex, it's pretty cool. Uh, it was pretty interesting to you know disassemble it, essentially look at the source code and figure out what exactly did they do to make it work. But it's very straightforward and it's uh, kind of cool. Right, so next thing we got here is Construct.js, a library for creating byte level data structures in JavaScript in declarative way. So yes, yes you can, you can like I, I, I honestly, I never had to do anything like this. So I'm not sure why you would want to do that. I mean, I guess there are valid use cases for that, but I just, yes, you can declaratively create byte structures in JavaScript now. And the, the API is actually looks quite nice. So if you're working with anything like that, uh, do check it out. This seems to be very cool. Next thing we got here is React keyframes. Keyframe based animations in React. This is a library from Site Guys. And if you ever seen any code samples on their website, I actually personally thought that was like a GIFs or something. 
Turns out there was actually a React animated and it just uses keyframes and it looks extremely easy to use and uh, looks pretty powerful. So yes, if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Merkle Trees JS, construct Merkle Trees and verify proofs in JavaScript. I honestly don't remember what Merkle Trees is. I think it's something from cryptography if my memory doesn't uh, fail me because I, I, ha I like I had a cryptography classes in university like what, no wait, was it 10 years ago? I guess 10 years ago. And I remember we talked about something like this, but I honestly don't remember what is this. Um, I think it is, it has something to do with the cryptography. So if you know what that is, then well, there you go. And you can now do that in JavaScript. If not, then let, you know what? Let me just click on this. Yes, it is cryptography. So there you go. Right, hash trees. There you go. This is a better name that I definitely recognize. So yes, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. This seems to be pretty cool. Next thing we got here is PWR, the cheated interactive CLI for NPM. Um, looks pretty nice. So the idea is that you can call power on a command line and then you will be presented with a list of tasks that you can select. Like for example, run some scripts from package.json and it will present you with a list of scripts. So it's sort of interactive instead of, you know, typing it yourself. If you person, if you are a person who doesn't like typing and just want to select everything from the, um, Reset options, I guess, check it out. This looks pretty slick, actually. All right, next thing we got here is MKJS, a canvas implementation of basic fighting game that allows multiplayer over network. And MK stands for Mortal Kombat, essentially. It looks surprisingly good. Like, you know, it's, it's a very basic demo, but you can move your character, you can jump, you can duck, you can uh, hit things. And there's like hitboxes and collision detection and everything. So if you ever was curious how that kind of uh, games are made, make sure to check out the source code. It is quite good. I mean, that's obviously it's a very basic demo and that's literally all you have, but there are some very interesting things under the hood. All right, next thing we got here is React Border Wrapper, a wrapper for placing elements along div borders. It sort of allows you to do fancy borders and uh, decorating those borders with other things, which I mean, I guess you would want in some cases, but there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Drop CSS, a simple, thorough, and fast and used CSS learner. Uh, clean, learner? What? No, cleaner. So it's a library that removes unused CSS by looking at the HTML code you pass to it and the CSS and then basically reasoning of which parts of the CSS are not used in HTML and then just giving you a clean CSS as a response. That's basically all it does. That sounds useful to check it out, but I think that's, you know, essentially in the React world, that's not exactly how we write CSS anymore, but. Right, next thing we got here is RRH, super simple React hooks for React Redux. If you cannot wait for React Redux um, version seven to be released and want to use hooks immediately, then well, there's this tiny library that essentially does this. Um, allows you to do this in relatively straightforward manner. Not sure how good is it, but yeah, looks simple enough to be quite nice essentially. Right, next thing we got here is Crumbs.js, a lightweight vanilla ES6 cookies in local storage JavaScript library. Seems to be a simple wrapper around cookies and uh, local storage that uses the same methods for both and allows you to read and set values to it. I mean, looks very simple. I'm not sure why would I use that over say simple local storage APIs, but maybe you know, so there you go. All right, next thing we got here is 0x single command line, uh, what? No, single command flame graph profiling. So it's a simple tool that allows you to do flame graph profiling literally in one command when you just use the zero X binary to run your app and get a flame graph as a result, which is kind of nifty. So if you needed to do some profiling, make sure to check this out. This is quite handy. Next thing we got here is typeless uh, for, I'm, I'm not sure why is it typeless because it's a uh, React apps with TypeScript, uh, Redux and RxJS. I'm not sure how it came to be timeless, but there you go. So if you were looking for a sort of all in one um, tool set for building apps with React TypeScript and uh, Redux and RxJS, then this might be your thing, check it out. Next thing we got here is NPM GUI, graphical tool for managing JavaScript project dependencies in a friendly way. Um, it's basically a server that shows you your package project, I guess, package JSON, all the NPM stuff, and allows you to 
tinker with it from the UI. I, I guess maybe it can be useful in some cases. As a person who strongly prefers command line tools for that kind of stuff, I don't know, I don't see any reason to use that, but maybe you do, so do check it out. Next thing we got here is APRX, a proxy it wrapper object for promise. So here's the thing. On one hand, I find this to be very smart and very cool. Um, the idea is that you can use this APRX function to wrap any promise. And then you can use methods like filter and map to work on, uh, like specifically in this case, map. You can map and then you can modify only one value on promise, right? Uh, on like field of the object, for example. And that will actually modify that value, but return the whole object. So in the end, you will get the same thing as you would expect. Now, on one hand, that looks really cool. So the way it works is by using ES6 proxy and by just, you know, listening to the uh, changes. Now, my problem with it is that I can almost foresee the bugs that would caused by people who don't know what is this and how it works. Because when you see this, you expect this to return like the value plus one, right? So you will be okay. So probably the result is going to be a number. Well, no, it's not a number. It's actually the same array. So it's kind of double edged sword. On one hand, it looks really cool and really smart. On the other hand, it's probably going to bite you back in the long run. But um, anyway, pretty interesting to read through the source code at least. So do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is from from a JavaScript library uh, to transform sequences of data from format to another. It looks very similar to stuff like RxJS and other data sort of querying transformation libraries, at least for iterables, because it only works on iterables and basically works on any iterable. So it uses the iterable protocol and allows you to uh, do link like things, which again, you know, RxJS is also sort of like link like things like filtering, sorting, and then con converting that back to array. It's also like lazy execution and everything. So I'm not, I think this needs comparison to RxJS because it looks way too similar to it. But yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Maybe it's actually smaller. I'm not sure like RxJS by this time is extremely large and has like a tons of operators that are probably <laughs> very hard to keep track of, but there you go. All right. Next thing we got here is log update, log by overriding the previous value in terminal, useful for rendering progress bars, animations, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, this basically says all of it. You can re-render the needed thing over and over again, used in libraries like Lister, Aura, Speed Test, and all the other things, and um, extract it into a separate library so you can re-render your own thing. There's a very nice animation showing how it works. If you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Multrin, organize multiple apps in a tabs. This is an um, Electron app that actually allows you to drag in windows and uh, combine them into one window. I'm honestly not sure why you would want to do that, but maybe you do. Um, so check it out. The interesting part for me was at least reading the source code to see how exactly it was implemented because I, know you, you, I did not know you could manipulate the windows in this way. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here, and the last one for today's libraries and demos is binjs ref, a reference implementation for JavaScript binary AST format. We talked about this uh, proposal quite some time ago. And the idea is that um, ES committee wants to introduce the new binary AST format that would speed up the parsing of JavaScript by 30 to 50%, right? And um, this is the first reference implementation of it, uh, made in Rust. So if you're curious, you can check it out. It is a pretty big step for the progress and I'm quite curious to see how that will develop because this should give us some quite significant improvements or uh, of uh, at least initial page renderings in JavaScript. So yes, this is quite exciting. All right, this is actually it for libraries and demos. And before we wrap this up, I've got a um, pretty amusing article here from Facebook. Uh, so Facebook just admitted that it stored hundreds of millions of account passwords in plain text. If you haven't heard about that, uh, that just happened last week and now they are actually, there's a possibility that they will get 1.6 billion US dollars fine from uh, European Union because of the GDPR breach essentially. 
But uh, you remember that article we talked about, I think last podcast or maybe two podcasts ago, where they asked the freelancers to implement the basic password storage and like 40 or 50% of them did it in plain text. Well, it turns out that scales quite nicely to the rest of the world. And this is basically how developers work. So about, uh, you could safely now assume that about half of the companies, whatever size they are, they are storing all of that stuff is in plain text. <laughs> Facebook is not accepting. It's just mind blowing. Our company that, um, I mean, just look at the Facebook, right? So they have incredibly talented engineers, right? The guys who brought us React, React Native. And there's like a billion of other tools that came out of Facebook open source that are absolutely amazing and crafted with love. And you can see that the people who build them, they care about that, right? And on the other hand, you have guys who handle the authentication and, and storage and they were like, ah, screw it, they will just store the passwords in plain text. It is insane when you think about that. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess, you know, as I said, it's quite safe to assume that the paper we saw last time saying that 40% of the freelance deve oh, of the developers store their passwords in plain text is pretty much accurate at this point. So there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically it for my side, guys. So if you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Um, you can find the link to the Humble. It is right here in the tips, tricks, and bit size awesomeness, Humble Book Bundle Web Programming by O'Reilly. Um, as usual on the GitHub and everything. Um, right. Uh, yeah, so if you have any other suggestions or questions, throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can wrap this up here. As usual, you can join our Discord server to chat about JavaScript or ask your questions. Um, yeah, we are more than happy to see you there. Let me have a look at this framework seven. I've never heard about it. Full featured framework for building iOS, Android and desktop apps, docs, templates. So how to, it's based on Apache Cordova. Um, okay. So it's basically um, just a web framework that provides a nice wrappers for Cordova and Electron. Well, I mean, it's, it's a nice way of building things. I, I don't know if I would use something like that. I think I prefer native approach, but, uh, yeah. Uh, count don't hate him. Man admits to tricking Facebook in a hundred million scam. Wait a second. What? Uh, Lithuanian man faces up to 30 years in prison after admitting his role in scheme that built Google and Facebook out of 121. What the? <laughs> okay. That sounds quite interesting. A uh, frauds related efficient scheme that can't to tech giants want a computer time. Okay. So what did he do? Was arrested, thought he would hide behind a computer screen halfway across the world. Don't click on this. Why, why do you mean don't click? I'm, I'm, I'm really curious as to what that guy did. Uh, scheme last year. So what is the scheme? Created fake corporate stamps, email accounts, and invoices purporting to be from... Qua oh, so he just sent them fake, fake invoices and they actually paid them? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think that's a new scheme, right? It's like he literally just... I, that's like, that's fraud straight up. Quanta imposter reportedly conned the account. Yeah, so he just created fake, uh, fake invoices and then them to the Facebook and Google and they... That's nothing new. I mean, come on, that's been out there for ages. The only thing is that he got caught. If he wouldn't be so greedy and did like three or four invoices, he would probably get away with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, Google gave about 23 million, Facebook gave about 98 million. Um, oh, I totally forgot to include one other article. Wait a second, I had another really awesome article. Um, so there was the game developer conference, right? And um, there was a bunch of devs who started arguing about uh, how to, you know, let's let's create a bot that generates garbage slot machine games. And it started as a joke. And then they had a talk at GDC where the joke actually outgrew this itself. And they, um, they the bot made like one app a day, I believe, or something. So it was like a, the marketplace was flooded with this garbage, essentially. But um, they actually made some games. So some of those slot games, for some reason, earned them 50,000 bucks. 
it is mined on, on advertisement. So the bot generated those slot apps by, you know, basically taking random garbage from internet. And the game called 3D Sexy Skin Slots, which is ridiculous on its own, had advertisement in there. It was downloaded 1.6 million times and it generated 50,000 US dollars, which is like, what is up with this world? I'm, like, what is this? It is insane. So, yeah. It is also quite, I probably should include that into the, um, I don't know, maybe next podcast. Let me just save it somewhere. Um, da, 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 let me do this and save it into my um, next podcast thingy. Yes, because this this article is just, I'm going to put it somewhere in the BXGS website because this is just too good to miss because this was absolutely amazing. But yeah, this, this is basically it from my side, guys. So thank you very much for watching. As usual, feel free to join our Discord to discuss JavaScript or ask for help or just talk about the articles that we covered here. Thank you guys very much for your support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week and I see you next time. Bye.